Thank you for tuning in to Hope TV, the television broadcast ministry of Hope Alive Freedom Church. We are real people offering real hope in a real world. Thank you so much for allowing me to come. Uh, it's a privilege. Um, I believe I've been sent by the Holy Ghost. Um, let me do some housekeeping. We got a book out front. It's called Church Fathers versus Kingdom Sons. An inheritance worth fighting for? Are you ready to rumble? It's my story. <clears throat> it's my story of trying to find out who I was in God and the inheritance of the kingdom and what was rightfully mine. And being just a little redneckish, I like to fight. <laughs> One of my friends says that he'll fight at the drop of a hat, and if he's bored, he'll drop the hat. And, you know, I know that in church we're supposed to be so prim and proper, and uh, that's never really worked out that well for me. And uh, I, it might be the way I met God. You know, I was born and raised in the Assembly of God Church. My father was a leader, not just in a local church, but in the region. He, he was well-respected. When they had a problem with a, a church in the region, they would send my dad. He was a Holy Ghost hit man. Um, it served me well years later when God would use me prophetically that it, my name opened up doors because of my father. And, uh, but we had issues because his Jesus and my Jesus spoke differently, did it differently. And uh, I didn't always please him. Do you know how bad a son wants to please a father? And it, it just seemed like no matter what I did, I couldn't do it. And I, I was trying to figure out why. And the problem was that I was trying to please an earthly father, and I didn't know God as a father because I was an orphan. And I got tied up into works. I got tied up into my gifting. I got tied up into myself. And that's just the good part. <laughs> but when I backslid, I went into a very destructive lifestyle. I was addicted to pornography. I was addicted to alcohol. I was rich. I had money. That made it worse because you can hide it. But I was a destructive. I was abusive to my wife. I was actually shocked that she left me. Other people weren't, but I was. But there was a hole in my heart that I couldn't fill with all the things of the world. Because I was raised in church. I went to all the... Sunday school classes and saw all the church fights. I saw my dad and four of his best friends that were deacons and elders vote people out and new preachers would come. And but at seven years old, I got sexually abused at knife point by one of the elder's sons that was 17.
I told his dad and his mom what this guy did. And they said they would tell my father. And they would fix it. 25 years later, my dad heard me preach in upstate New York at a men's conference. And he heard the story. And my father said to me, I never knew that. And I called him a liar. He made a statement to me. He says, what, what happened? What did that do to our relationship? I says, from seven years old to this day, I've never trusted you. Because you were supposed to protect me. And I held it against you. And I've come to find out it was a lie that I, he didn't know. How many know that there's a devil out there trying to lie against you? To destroy your relationships with your father and your mother and your spiritual father. And that's what the devil does, and he's pretty stinking good at it. But I I said I was a redneck, and I found out that the devil had betrayed me, so I decided to go ahead and wear him out. That's why I wrote the book. And I realized that my father, who's, his dad died when he was 11, was a natural orphan and a spiritual orphan. Because, see, you reproduce what you are, not what you say you are. I recommend my book. It, it, it'll, it'll tune you up. Uh, there's a guy named Dr. Dale, uh, Dr. Whalen Ward with two doctorate degrees, and he bought 10 of my books one time, and I said, what, you know, sat down with him, and he said, I, I got 50,000 hours of counseling, and he said, there was a man who has been doing counseling for six years, and he came to your house for five days, and you did more for him in five days than I have in years. I need some books. So he reads... Two weeks later, he calls me, and he reads my book, and he said, listen, I don't believe anything you wrote. We don't agree on nothing. But when I closed the book, I said to God, God, if what this man wrote is true, prove it. And God sucked him out of his body, took him to heaven, where his father had been dead for almost 30 years. And his father was sitting beside a table and poured a glass of wine from the wine room of heaven that had his dad's name on it. And he had a conversation with his father, and his father told him how much he loved him and how proud he was, and it changed the man's life. And he goes, man, you're crazy. This is real. Heaven's real. This healing of the broken heart is real. So I'm going to share with you a message that has taken me 20 years to put together. I do function as a prophet. I'm a New Testament prophet, not an Old Testament prophet, and it took me a while to figure out the difference. One's mean and one's nice. That's the, we can go home now. That's the bottom line right there. But I do, I do recommend my book. Um, I hate to promote it, except some of you need to read it because I'll never talk to you again. But you need the information in it. It'll change your life. And I don't want to bring them home on the airplane. Let's get real here. I've been in business most of my life. I've made a lot of money. I've lost more money than most people have made because of ungodly decisions. But God has always had his hand, and he's trained me about the kingdom. He's trained me about the principles of the kingdom through business. One of the things he had me do is take my 24-year-old son, fresh out of uh, Bible school, and put him in business with me. And then God said to me, he's better at business than you are. Put him as the head of your company, and you and your wife submit to him. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I'm going to show you how the kingdom works. Do you know how difficult that is when you're a control freak like me? to have your kid now be your boss. And I would be mad at God because he fired his brother. He took his mother out of her position. Then he made her to come back and work without pay. He didn't fire her because she hates that word. But she worked without pay. I don't know how he got that done. Then he cut my salary in half, and I was mad. And the Lord would say, I told you to submit to authority. He said, why don't you quit bellyaching about your son and why don't you take him for coffee like a father 
and find out, find out why he's doing what he's doing in your company. He taught me how to father because I had to learn how to submit to authority in his gifting and to learn to communicate with honor. Jason is very, very methodical. My oldest son is a thinker. He's got a degree in biblical literature, the Aramaic, the Greek, the Hebrew. He doesn't quite know how to discern redneck yet, but he'll... And I remember saying to God, God, how's, how's this working? This, this, this isn't working. He says, it's not working because you don't honor him. It's not working because you think your prophetic gift outranks his logical gift. Oh, I'm talking. And I would pop off prophetically and be accurate. And I would have to give him time to process what God was showing him. And if I gave him enough time, he would come two, three weeks later with a full blueprint. All right, here's how much money you need to start making in this region. Here's what you need to get here. Here's the customer base. Here's the amount of money we're going to need. And he would have a full blueprint to do it. He was the wheels to my wagon. And I believe that we have the five-fold ministry gifts in the church that does a lot of popping off. That was good. That was real good. I'm going home tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I asked, asked the Lord, why, what was my assignment coming to this church? And he showed me a, a Capitol building over top of this house. And I was a little offended because we all know he's running for government position, and that's not real prophetic when you know it in the natural. And I have an ego as big as a house, and, and, and I wanted some more insight. And so for three days, he got to talk to me about it. But on the way to the airport, I saw this house with government coming on top of it, but I saw blood, sweat, and tears running down the outside walls. And he started speaking to me about the blood, sweat, and tears. And, they, and his conversation was when this structure was built, when the church was built with blood, sweat, and tears, there's people that got offended and wounded. And Christians turned your offenses and your wounds into word curses. And there's been word curses spoken against the house and against the leadership. So yesterday at prayer, Pastor Bobby was up here, and he was dealing with a spirit of poverty. I think he's got a little redneck in him, too. He likes warfare. It excites him. Makes his motorboat run. But I was back in the back, and I slipped into the heavenly realms, and I went into the court of heaven, and I saw the enemy with a stack of papers. And, and the enemy always works on legal rights or what he legally can hold back. And I'm going to tell you, God can speak blessing over you, but if the enemy has legal paperwork on you, you'll never receive it. That's the benefit of the cross. And so this morning at the first service, I asked Bobby if he would allow me to represent him in this church, the leadership, in the courts of heaven, and I asked him to give me money as a, as a fee to represent him, just like you do an attorney in a court case. And so I, I did a prayer of repentance and repented for all of the blood, sweat, and tears that were offenses and wounds that, that, that Christians had turned into word curses. And I was taking the paperwork out of the devil's hands. He no longer has a legal right to withhold your blessing if you're part of the house now. Now it's up to you to push in faith and get what God has promised you. Did you hear that? I asked Bobby for permission uh, during your offering today that, that if, if, if me and Susie and, and uh, where, where Corey, is Corey here? Yeah. I want, I want to pray over your wallets. I want to pray over your, your pocketbooks. 
I'm going to pray over your checkbooks because, listen, if, I, if, if God sent me here to take the legal paperwork out of the enemy's hands, now you've got to exercise what God's already promised you. Don't be waiting for another prophetic word. Why don't you dig the one up you ain't done nothing with last time? And find out what's been holding that thing back and get your promotion at work. Get your inheritance that some knucklehead stole from you. Get back what was stolen. See, see, once, see, once you take... What you take this thing out of the enemy's hands and he still withholds it from you, he no longer has a legal right. Now he's a thief. You can make him pay back seven times. Catch this principle here. See, the problem is we want to make him pay back seven times, but you've never dealt with the offense or you never dealt with the curse or you never dealt with the reason why he's holding it back. And so when you come into total alignment, when you come with total alignment in the courts of heaven, you're, you're you're bringing your petition before the Lord. The enemy's trying to hold it against you. You take the paperwork out of his hands. He can't accuse you anymore. And then you say in that courtroom where Jesus, the ultimate is, you say, I had a prophecy from the Lord that said I'm supposed to be in promotion. I'm supposed to have finances. I'm supposed to have this. I'm supposed to have that. And then you hear Jesus repeat what he already told you through prophecy or the word, now you have the mouth of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Then there's a new piece of paper that is established in the courts of heaven, and God decrees the release on what he promised you. That's prophecy. Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So when you come in agreement with him, and he comes in agreement with you, the ultimate judge goes, there's a case against the enemy now. And that's how we function in the kingdom realm. But see, if you look at Scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can you bring as it is on earth as it is in heaven if you've never been there? How many are seated in heavenly places? Really, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What information are you getting? This is not a trick question. This is actually, I'm asking a question. If you'll start processing that, God will drop stuff in your spirit and you will walk out of your doorway in the morning looking for a deposit on earth. Something to deposit. Something to encourage somebody. To expand the kingdom. That's bringing heaven to earth. That's expanding. That, that becomes fun. And listen, it's outside. It's your lifestyle. It's not your church style. It's your lifestyle. And I believe in the church. I mean, if you've ever been around Brian Higby, we fight about it all the time. He's wrong most of the time. Until he gets mad, and he's 350 pounds. I love Brian. He makes me better because he's my big brother. See, I, Papa Jack, I'm his favorite. And I'm much more gentle with him. But brothers you can fight with, unless you're wounded and your ego's in your gift. That's what I meant to say that. Do you know what ego stands for? Edging God out. I'm going to talk to you about my hats. I was an orphan because I didn't trust my father. Therefore, I didn't trust God. I had my sin issues. I was in the middle of a divorce. My wife didn't like me, and I knelt down by a pool table. 2.30 in the morning, 1993. Successful in the natural, broken in every other way. I prayed a prayer. If you're the God of my mother, she said you had power. She said you had enough power 
to give a man a new heart. If you're that God, I give you a chance to change my heart. I'm an evil, wicked man, and I listed my junk. But if you don't give me a new heart, I'll never be able to serve you. This is your only chance if you're that God. Now, that's a good prayer. I got up, I took two steps, and I thought, man, I guess God's not God. At least not now. And all of a sudden, bam, lightning went off in the room. And out of the lightning, Jesus Christ walked through. And he stood in front of me like a man standing in front of me. And he put his hand on me. He says, Charlie Coker, you put your hand in my hand. I'll never leave you, forsake you. Or, he pointed, I'll let hell have its way with you. And I realized he was threatening to kill me. Some of you met sweet baby Jesus. I met the Lion of Judah. I have a little different makeup on who he is. Because, you know, some of you, oh, Jesus loves me. I'm thinking, that sucker tried to kill me at least four times now. Why? Because I made a deal with him. He told me he had, he had a destiny on my life. He had a calling on my life. And at that moment, nothing else would matter but pleasing him. Then he, he, he said to me, now that you've chosen me, and he gave me a vision of 20 couples in a marriage ceremony. Then he gave me another vision of standing in front of 10,000 people preaching the gospel. <clears throat> the problem is he didn't tell her. And that woman did not like me. And for a year, I had to, I had to just believe what God told me. And in, in Valentine's Day of the following year, I, I think I just bugged her to death. And she finally showed up at my mom and dad's church. And it was Valentine's weekend. And she just said to me, she, just to get me off her butt, let's just go up and renew our marriage vows. As we're doing it, God says, look at the, count the couples. It was 20 couples. God started healing. That very next weekend, I went to Carpenter's Home Church in Lakeland, and my name got pulled out of a, a list that they put, and I stood up in front of 10,000 people and started sharing what God was doing in my life. But I met a king who had a kingdom, and I realized that he had life and death in his hands, and I realized that my brokenness was hindering my ability to function. So I dove in the word. I started figuring out, how does this work? And I realized that I was called to be a prophet. So I wore the prophet's hat. The problem is, the prophet's hat by itself, you become mean. I see your junk, I expose your junk. You either love me or you don't. And you, go, you get, you get Dodd, got open up doors, and you walk into churches, and you're going, okay, that one's sleeping with that one. That one's sleeping. I think this is, place needs to be ichabod they never invite you back when you do stuff like that. It's hard to make a living in ministry when you blow the place up and nobody likes you anymore. Didn't mean I wasn't accurate. I blew this one place up with accuracy. I knew it was accurate. Thirteen years later, everything I prophesied came to true. And, and people died, and I prophesied it. The church no longer existed, I prophesied it. The pastor and his wife got divorced, I prophesied it. Thirteen years later, I get invited back to the church. And I said to the Lord, you know, it's about time you validated I was accurate. Why did it take so long? He said, it took you 13 years to love him enough for me to reveal it to him. Now are you going to go fix some of this? And I realized that I was an orphan and a prophet. The fivefold ministry is gifts. Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But those are gifts. And I had my identity wrapped up in my gift. And so much of the church does. But then I met Jack Taylor. And God said he's going to be your spiritual father when you mature. It took eight years to meet Papa Jack. And then I became a son. I started dealing with my orphanism. And I started being introduced to God as a father. And I realized that he loved me without doing crazy prophet stuff. He loved me because he loved me because he loved me. Papa Jack didn't discipline me 
for almost two and a half years. He loved me. He encouraged me. As a father, he kept telling me who I was, not who I thought I was. And all of a sudden, the sonship and the the encounters I started having, Jesus would come and take me and introduce me to his father. And I realized God loved me. And that mean, angry prophet started dying on the inside. And I started going into the courts of heaven, and I started reading Revelations where it says that we're kings and priests. And and I started learning that if I'm a son and I function as a priest, I could bring the sins of my wife, I could bring the sins of my children, I could bring the sins of my company and present it to God, and he would wash it away. But then what is a king? I'm a businessman. A king has rulership. A king puts himself in a place to judge. And I realized because I had now become a son and I had the principles of my father in heaven that I could bring the right sacrifice. I could repent for my sins, your sins, the church's sins, the city's sins, a region's sin. And then, as a king, I can judge properly. Listen, this sloppy grace stuff Do I need to go there? The Lord said to me, grace should be an offensive weapon to walk in holiness, not a defensive excuse to you to walk in sin. Listen, I I gave my heart to Jesus to save me and to keep me from sin, not to give me the an excuse to continue to sin. And this sloppy grace has got to stop somewhere because, listen, it's an empowerment to walk in holiness. And you will not see God, you will not function in the kingdom without holiness. And listen, it's going to take some grace to get there. It's going to take some love to cover it for when you get there. But listen, I'm a judge. I'm a judge. I sit in in councils over cities. I sit in councils over regions. I was sharing with Pastor Bobby. I got it sucked up into a court system of, of heaven over a city one time, and my, my vote on a pastor, because of his lifestyle, eliminated his ministry. I got done with that. I was like, man, it was, that was a huge promotion in the kingdom. I said, Lord, what test did I pass that gave me the qualifications to sit and judge He says, last week, when you were willing to judge your own son because of his lifestyle, any man that will judge his son is qualified to judge a city. Judging properly in love is part of the kingdom. Not judging out of a broken gift. What you tolerate will dominate. My youngest son was living with a woman that was a full-blown devil. A full-blown devil. And she was separating that young boy from my wife and me. And I let it happen because I had been known to do things. And I was waiting and waiting. And one day the Holy Spirit said to me, how long are you going to tolerate your son's behavior? I said, I've been waiting on you. So I I called him up. I said, Brian, that woman's a devil. You're playing house with her, and she's destroying you, and she's separating you from from, from this family. You either marry her, so there's a covenant between you and her that I can pray for her, and get her saved, or you'll bury her. He's like, you can't do that. I said, you watch me. A few days later, he showed up, and he sat down. He said, Dad, does heaven really do what you tell it to do? I said, pretty much. What's up? He goes, a few days after we had our little talk there, that woman tried to stab me with a knife. He goes, I think she's a devil. He said, I ain't living with her no more either. I was like, Really? What are you tolerating? 
What are you tolerating? Now listen, you can't judge if you're just a broken prophet. Because you, you, you won't judge through your sonship. You won't judge through your repent. Listen, the lifestyle of repentance comes from the priestly hat that I'm wearing. You, you can't judge properly unless you're a priest. You can't judge properly unless you're a son because you'll judge and it'll become curses. See, when I judge, it's not a judgment of wrath. It's a judgment of mercy. I just messed up half your theology right there. Because you've been taught, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Well, judge yourself then. At least you be judged. I've told people in my church, listen, if you don't start judging yourself, yourself, some judge is going to. Some prison system is going to. Because you have to. But listen, the kingdom of God functions in these realms. Here's the problem. You always leave your sonship, your sonship hat on. So when I now function as a prophet, I'm coming in as a son and a gift. My identity is not in my gift. My identity is in my relationship with God the Father as a son. Here's the issue, though. If, 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 if I'm a son and you're a son, guess what we are? We're brothers. We're brothers. And so as God started dealing with me because I had to break down how I functioned in my ministry, how I functioned in my relationships. I mean, I'm a horse's butt. Gifted, but I was legalistic and opinionated. My opinions had opinions. And a prophet with an opinion is dangerous. I can remember one day God said to me, he says, you know, you don't really have uh, my ways, and my ways are higher than your ways, and I'll prove it today. I said, okay. So we went to a meeting, and, and I don't do a lot of personal prophecy. I can if God bumps me, and God bumps me with this guy that I knew. I didn't like the guy. I knew his lifestyle. I, knew his, I didn't like the guy at all. And God says, I want you to give him a word. So I prophesy over the guy. I don't believe anything I said. And I got done, and the Lord said to me, he says, you see, that was my words, not yours. Maybe you need to change your heart toward him. A prophet with an opinion is dangerous. Too much of the body of Christ has an opinion. They haven't taken it to the Lord to figure out how to walk out the relationships. So I, I, I get Papa Jack as a father. I get my sonship. And now I have brothers. Brian Higby's a brother. Eddie's a brother. Pastor Bobby's a brother. Now, brothers, I believe there's a synergy going on in the brotherhood right now. The kingdom of God, the government of God, is starting to, to, to filter through the church system and become kingdomized. And now you've got brothers. I'm coming in here as an uncle. I can say things that some of you can't, wouldn't dare say. It wouldn't be healthy if you did. Besides, I'm leaving. I have a son that came to New York and kind of took over my New York ministry. And it happened early in the morning. I was in New York, been doing this for 20 years. That kind of was my region where I, I would travel once a month. I would get an airplane. I would fly, come in Friday morning, go home Monday night. And I would repent for the sins of the region. I would repent for the sins of the church in that region. And I gained authority in the kingdom. And uh, the Lord said to me, do you believe in the Father-Son paradigm? I said, yes, I do. I'm convinced. I'm sold. I'm in. He says, good. Go lay hands on Randy and give him everything that you've done and get out of New York. Well, that's hard to do when you have an ego as big as mine because now it's not about me. And he says, I said, but Lord, why? Why? He said, your hands are too bloody. Give Randy what you got. And listen, here's the thing. In 18 months, he pulled off more tent meetings in cities than I did in 18 years. And I say I'm, I'm saying that in this house. I said it in the earlier service. I told that story in the earlier service because, because listen, there's a generational shift going on in this house. And listen, some of the, the, the second-tier leadership that's been around and it's kind of, 
kind of sitting back trying to figure out what God's doing, your hands are bloody from your past, but God's trying to wash your hands. He's trying to purify your heart. Why? Because, because there's, a, there's a fresh generation that's going to step on what's been built, and you're going to see the kingdom manifest in you. And what, what took Bobby years, you'll do in months. What took him months, you'll do in weeks. What took him weeks, you can do in days, and many things you can get by the laying on of his hands or the power of his blessing. That's how the kingdom works. So Randy calls me, and, he, and, he, and, and, and I go into a vision when he calls, and I got the fathering hat on. He said, hey, Pop, I got some questions. I'm having this meeting in this city. I'm having a meeting in this city. Who do you think? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm giving him my fatherly advice. And all of a sudden, you hear a hiccup in his voice. And I go into another vision, and bam, he's wearing the fathering hat. I'm wearing this hat, and he doesn't know how to talk to me. Because, see, in the kingdom, it's all about honor. And all of a sudden, he needed to say something to me that he thought would normally offend me. Normally, he thought that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the daddy here. And finally, I said, listen, the hat's just changed. Tell me as if you were my spiritual father what you think I need to hear. And he says, I planned these meetings, but I don't want you to come to New York. I said, why? He said, this is my time and my turn to shine. And dude, it hurt. But it was accurate and it was God. And I said, I agree. I, I shouldn't come. Then all of a sudden, both of us had a brother's hat on and we started debating about some doctrinal thing. And I heard the Lord say, when my people catch my spirit, they can change hats and have a greater relationship. It won't be competition. It won't be positional authority. It'll become relational authority. You know, and so when the kingdom is manifest, you as a house will have much more authority than you have right now, but it will be based on relationship, not on position. Now, you won't lose position. You still got to have position. Because listen, the fivefold ministry is definitely has a place, but it's not eternal. It's not eternal. This is eternal. This is eternal. This is temporal. And I love these prophets. I'm a prophet. Good. You're going to be not needed here shortly. Why? Because I'm going to become mature, and I'm going to tell myself what to do. When, you, when the body becomes mature, you don't need the fivefold ministry. When the body becomes enough maturity and comes into enough unity, we don't need the fivefold. The problem is we need it because we won't deal with our rebellion, and we won't deal with our woundedness. Go to Matthew chapter 5. You getting anything out of this? Matthew chapter 5. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old... You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Dude, that's pretty good war warnings on your mouth. Verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift, therefore, at the altar, and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. That's literally what I did for Bobby, is I came in, and dealt with the agreement of the adversary over the blood, sweat, and tears. Those are, those are Christian word curses. Listen, I, I, I will wake up in the middle of the night and have arrows stuck in my spirit and go, what the heck is it? And there's been times prophetically that, 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 that I've said, God, I need to find out what this is. And I will trace that word curse 
and I will pop into somebody's living room and listen to a conversation of them cursing me. Don't think your words don't have power. The problem is they do, you just don't, you just don't have the heart to understand it. The devil can get you to curse your brother. He's done his job. It's called witchcraft. Christian witchcraft. Wow. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has aught with you, Leave your gift before the altar and then go your way. Listen, I read that multiple times. And the Lord said, read it again, read it again, read it again. And all of a sudden I realized as a functioning prophet, I had offended a bunch of people. And the Lord said, read it again. You think that scripture is about money only? Go to Ephesians. They're the gifts. The office of apostle is a gift. The office of prophet is a gift. The Lord said, would you leave your gift at the altar and go fix it with your brother? So when I become so dogmatic about me being right spiritually, and I overrule the principles of love, I become a cursor and not an encourager. And so, the Lord started showing me the difference between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet. The Old Testament prophet called out sin, called nations in, into judgment. The New Testament prophet, according to Malachi chapter 4, is the spirit of Elijah is going to come, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the father, at least I strike the land with a curse. We're reconcilers. And if you're always calling out someone's sin, to expose them, you're going to have to go back and fix it. Listen, did Jesus Christ take care of this, take the sins of the world on the cross? Answer me. Did Jesus take care of all the sins of the world on the cross? Then you don't have a sin problem and neither does the world. It only has a revelation problem. And if you'll bring a revelation of love and care more about your brother instead of your Information in your gift, sin won't be a problem. Wounding won't be a problem. Word cursing won't be a problem. And the kingdom of God will manifest. And then God can promote the body of Christ. And we will walk around and we will, we will understand that we carry the kingdom. What are you getting in your prayer time? You, you, do, you, do you ask God, what, what, what's today going to bring? God, do you need a prophet today? God, do you need a pastor today? God, do you need an evangelist today? These are gifts. I'd like to play with my gift today. Woo-hoo! Want me to teach somebody something? Woo-hoo! And the Holy Ghost will give you insight if you love enough. If you love enough. Because listen, my job is to equip you to where you don't need me. Not as a not as a five-fold minister. I said it in early service. I need to say it again. The orphan spirit, the orphan heart, I should say, is rampant in the church because there hasn't been any, many fathers. There have been a lot of preachers, but not many fathers in the kingdom. I've pursued some people in my church, given them my phone number. They talk to me. They want my undivided attention, but they never show up. I had this one guy in particular. Susie was mad at him more than I was because he was calling at 11 o'clock at night. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I told him I would father him. I, I, I prayed a father's blessing over him. I unlocked some things in his life. I gave him some revelation. But this guy won't engage 
I said, he keeps crying. I'm an orphan. I'm an orphan. I have orphan thinking. He had some issues. He had so many issues, we tried to make him do a newspaper. You know, he had issues. This, this month's issue, next month's issue. You know, but eventually the Lord said to me, that boy doesn't have an orphan problem. He has a hobo spirit. I said, what's a hobo spirit? A hobo spirit has a father and has a house, but he's unwilling to do the requirement of sonship. A hobo wants to come in and steal your inheritance, but he doesn't want to do the requirement of son. He doesn't want to take out the trash. He doesn't want to come to the meetings. He doesn't want to do the things. He just wants the benefit of having your last name. He says, break that hobo spirit off him. So I got to praying, well, I broke that hobo spirit off him. Ain't seen him since. Why? Because he didn't want to be a son. Now, I didn't do that quickly. That was, what, probably almost eight, nine-month process. But I'm telling you, you need to break the hobo spirit off of yourself, off of your family. You need to address the orphanism thinking and go to God the Father and say, I, I need to know you as a father. Ladies, your sons. I'm a son, you're a son. We're all sons, okay? Brian Higby was at my church last week, and he said, if I can be the bride, then you can be sons. I almost corrected him. Matter of fact, my people looked over, and I went, nah, he's too big. (laughs) Your sons, ladies, equal to me as a male, as a female, your sons. Listen, and together we make the bride. I'm not the bride. You're not the bride. We are the bride. And when the bride gets this system of the kingdom down pat, you're going to see miracles start popping on their own. Miracles are the dinner bell, the dinner bell of the gospel. And I've heard the Lord say the dinner bell of the gospel in this house is about to start ringing. Are the sons in place to disciple? Are the sons in place to mentor? Are the sons in place to serve? Or are you going to be an orphan? Or are you going to be a hobo? That's a good word. Tell your face that. Because y'all look at me like, who the heck is this guy? I just looked in the court of heaven just a moment ago. The enemy has no paperwork on this house. Which means some of you, there's no paperwork against you. But if you don't show up, he'll win by default. The enemy is winning by default more than he even has a legal right. Because the people of God are not pursuing the kingdom the Lord the Lord, it's very clear in scripture if you'll preach the kingdom I'll build the church Jesus said that I didn't Jesus said pursue the kingdom which means pursue the king of the kingdom he'll show you how it functions and there's fivefold ministry I, I, Eddie, Eddie's brought me to every restaurant in this city so far and I've sat with a lot of you leaders. There's prophets amongst you that are called to the region. There's evangelists among you. But there's wounded sons among you too. You fought the good fight and some of you have been hurt. Some of you are crying to God, I need to get healed because I can't fight anymore unless I know you're real. 
I'm hearing the Lord, some, some of you are wanting God to heal your heart, but you won't give him both halves. Some of you are weary. But the Bible's clear, don't be weary in well-doing. Because that weariness will turn. And the Lord will manifest his grace upon you. Three angels just walked in the back and they got a pitcher of oil and he's, they're, they're here to heal some of you. Some of you are bruised. Some of you feel rejected. Just close your eyes. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Lord, will you give me some of that oil? I need to be healed. I know I have a gift, but I need to be healed. I need to be healed. I need fresh oil. First and foremost, the oil needs to be poured here. You've been nicked, you've been bruised, you've been battered. just release that fresh oil the fresh oil of the kingdom that oil that heals with a midnight dream that oil that heals with a clear word that oil that says well done I'm proud that oil that comes and empowers I heal every word curse that has pierced your spirit. I command, I command healing to it right now. The unjust criticism that has been sent as an arrow from hell to slow you down and stop you. I release the oil of healing. a shift church listen just move your heart toward this family they're handpicked by God I said it in the earlier service I need to say it again listen if, if God has sent you here for their oversight you need to submit to that process whether you like it whether you don't whether you agree or whether, whatever it is get over yourself but you need to pray that God will give them insight to the oversight that you've submitted to. And you will see the kingdom. Listen, you will see that Bobby start popping in the prophetic and getting revelation about who you are and you thought he was dead as a doornail. God will start popping on the inside and give him strategies on the tools that he has been sent. You're the tools. You're gonna go into your workplace and you're gonna expand the kingdom. Because listen, divine order comes in. But you need to start praying, God, give, give them insight. Because I trust you, Lord, because I've been sent for their oversight. But give them insight. And I believe with all my heart that he will mold you into God's image, not into his. Did you hear that? I've seen the increase of the house. I've also seen the battle of the house. And you will win. God will win. And you will see salvations come. You will see wheelchairs emptied. You will, you, you will see the miraculous. Because that is what God does when the kingdom comes into alignment. The blood, sweat, and tears that got you here 
is nothing in comparison to the blood that Christ is about to release because there's power in the blood. So Father, I bless this house. God, I thank you for what the house has done. But God, I rejoice in what it's about to do. Mm, yeah. I just saw a vision of someone going, owie, owie, owie. Put some more oil on that sandpaper. God is smoothing out some rough edges in some of us. So release the oil, Father. Release the oil, the balm of Gilead, healing. Release it now in Jesus' name. Receive it. Receive it. Some of you have got gifts that are starting to burn in your belly right now that you haven't used in, in a long time. God is saying you're being released to use your gifting, but it's not your identity. Your identity is going to come into a new alignment of who he is, who God is, and who you are in him. And then your gifting becomes an ex, a kingdom expander. So I release the gifts of the body, the body that needed, the encouragement, the healing gifts. I release the healing gifts right now. Sheha, I release, I release the healing gifts. Somebody's back's getting healed right now. Somebody's back's getting, who's got back issues? Who's dealing with back issues? Just reach out, just take, take your healing. God's speaking it. Listen. Shuha. Thank you, Lord. I bless this house. I bless this leadership. I bless the leadership. Holy Spirit, breathe upon them the breath of God. Leaving. So, how about I bless and dismiss everybody this morning? So it's not this real awkwardness. But those of you that want your some blessing, you you can just stay around and and uh, and the worship team will continue to sing until we're done. Amen. So why don't you go ahead and lift your hands up before the heavens. Let me bless you. May the amazing grace of Jesus, the extravagant love of the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Ghost be yours forever and ever as you choose to walk in kingdom power to release kingdom in all the earth. In Jesus' name, and all God's people agree with that, said amen. Pastor Bobby would love to have the opportunity to pray for you and your family. Our service times are Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. If you would like more information about the ministries of Hope Alive Freedom Church, check out our website at www.hopealive.com. And thanks again for tuning in.